They are one of the most versatile vegetables around, and that's part of the reason why they are the vegetable of the year. We're talking about beans. We'll also show you some great perennial filler plants and answer all your hot topic questions straight ahead on Great Gardening. We celebrate each year um, as we receive it. For good nutrition, we need a balance of colors. I like to can because I'm a gardener. We brought home an orchard for our community. This was just an overgrown area full of bramble. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. The bean is the pick of the year for the One Vegetable, One Community project. Our experts at the table have grown their share of beans. They are Tom Casper, president of Duluth Garden Flower Society and Bob Olin, St. Louis County educator and horticulturist. Welcome back, gentlemen. Uh, we are going to talk about beans, but I know that uh, you got out there today and uh, have been in the garden for yeah, a few hours. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. A couple beautiful. of days Wonderful. we're celebrating here and the, the timely rain from mm -hmm. a few days ago. Yeah. We Stuff. waited a long time for this time, and I think we deserve some good weather. Yeah, we stuff's sure growing do. now. Yeah. We sure do. Okay, a lot to talk about, but we also want to welcome back our phone volunteers who are here to take your called in questions. They're from the Duluth Garden Flower Society's Lake Superior Master Gardeners Club. Uh, so give them a call at 218-788-2844, 877-307-8762 is the toll free number, or you can email your questions during this half hour to Ask Gardening at WDSE. Dot o -R -G. Well, we want to begin with this plant that um, we've talked about as a trending favorite because of its interesting foliage. And uh, we got a number of varieties provided to us by Burns in Zim. Uh, one of our phone volunteers was up there and sent back these plants, which we wanted to share with people because you can see uh, why people love them for the leaf color. These are coral bells or Huchera, which I've called Huchera, but now I know better. <laughs> and, um, and this one, um, so cool, the uh, crimson curls, because it's really going to get a bright kind of a, a burgundy colored leaf yep. when they start to mature. And some of these other ones by you, Tom, will yeah. change yeah, color and, as well. Yeah, Patlos Purple Coral Bell. It's been around a long time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and not only do you have this great variety in foliage and even some different shapes, the foliage they also have beautiful flowers that are wonderful for attracting hummingbirds and butterflies mm -hmm. and bees to the garden as well so lots of variety and lots of fun no wonder they're so popular and uh, we put them in uh, part sun part shade yep yeah they don't like a lot of afternoon sun so if you can get them in the morning or sort of dappled sunlight is really perfect for them so all right that's the hookara or coral bell and we want to thank burns again for providing those for us well, we have some questions and answers, questions, not answers yet, but uh, save these from last week and also some were emailed in. Doris from Carleton wants to know what type of blackberries to plant and uh, when, where, and what zone? Oh, blackberries are always a challenge because oh. uh, they're not typically winter hardy in this area. There are some individual varieties uh, that may make it, but uh, you really have to have a good protected uh, site uh, that typically zone five plants. Uh, if you've got a, uh, a good site where there may be a heat leak from a foundation or something mm -hmm. like that, then you could give them a try. But most of the time we have a real challenge of getting them to fruit in overwinter. Not highly recommended <clears throat> no. in this area. I know then. one of our gardeners, Steve in Lakeside, uh -huh. Uh, grows blackberries, but okay. again, very protected site protected and has site. had pretty good success with them. So. Good for him. Which shrubs are the best to plant if you don't want the deer to eat them? <laughs> <laughs> That's from Annette in Rice Lake Township. Well, there's there are some choices, but we are certainly finding out that that list becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. Um, I had, depending on sun or shade, but bush honeysuckle is okay. a good choice. Uh, they do stay away from the viburnums as well. Some of those natives that have really grown in our woods for years and years without the deer negatively impacting them, people should look for. Dogwood is another good choice. So. Uh, barberry as well, I think yeah. would be a good choice. I, th I think that uh, this last year in particular, they were so hungry that they ate things that we thought were at least deer resistant. We saw them foraging on spruce of all things yeah. rather than arborvitae which they cleaned up already. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, uh, Carol from Duluth wants to know, if I'm unable to plant or maintain my vegetable garden for a one year period, should I seed something there? Oh, yeah, I think it'd be a great opportunity to come mm -hmm. in and seed some, uh, either some winter rye or some buckwheat or something so you get a good cover crop. The real nice advantage of a cover crop is you will till that in the next year. Uh, if you're using one of the legumes, you pick up a little additional nitrogen. Clover would be an example there. Uh, the big thing is you're also going to keep the weeds under control. So by all means, just don't let it go. Seed it in with a, a good green cover crop or what they'll call a green manure crop. Right. Well, and, and if Carol doesn't want to do her vegetable garden, there's the, the program going on that Bob is involved with as well where they are, are using some of those unused vegetable garden spaces to oh. grow food for some of the local food shelves and there is an opportunity if, if she was interested in doing something like that to, as well. To, for so. instance, loan it out? Yeah, that's, that's the thing. We occasionally, mm -hmm. we've got a number of growers involved in a program called uh, Growing for a Cause, which is being worked uh, through uh, Second Harvest for distribution of fresh product and fresh product. And if she wants to contact me, we can, uh, we, and has the available space, willing to loan it out, we could probably find a gardener that would tend it for her. Okay. All right. Good, good idea. Um, Debbie from Cromwell wants to know what's a good weed be gone solution and she mentions something with vinegar, Epsom salts and Dawn dish soap. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? It, well anything with vinegar in it um, is certainly going to burn down the plants. Okay. <clears throat> it isn't something that she's going to want to apply in her lawn in a in a weed be gone kind of setting where you'd use more for a lawn type of application. I mean that's going to burn down whatever it hits. It's not going to kill the root system more than mm -hmm. likely it's just going to burn the tops off though. and so. usually it's just young seedlings so a product like we begun uh, is a broadleaf control and uh, a vinegar solutions will take uh, all kinds of plants yep all right uh, one more i think we have time for this segment judy wants to know about a bailey's new introduction minnesota red bud and the hardiness of that Ooh, how hardy is that yeah. yeah we love red bud i would say if you're a strong zone 4B, I'd give it a try, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know if it's going to really do that well here. Okay. Yeah, and, I, and I've tried over the years to grow red bud, and I know down in the cities they have uh, some pretty healthy ones at the Arboretum mm -hmm. um, and have uh, tried numerous times to grow them here, and it just seems like we get work. that test winter. Like this past winter um, was probably a test winter for a lot of our plant material that sure. was sort of on the fence and uh, I would probably stay away from it. Okay. Yeah, we did learn a little bit about the hardiness of some of these materials. We still have a very cold climate that we're mm -hmm. dealing with here. If it survived this winter, it's doing pretty well. Doing yep. pretty well, All right. yes. Now on to the vegetable of the year, which is easy to grow, easy on the environment, and of course, delicious to eat. So the 2014 Vegetable of the Year for the One Vegetable, One Community program is beans. Beans went out, I think, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is they're, uh, they're pretty easy to grow. They're beautiful. There's thousands of varieties, 40,000, I've heard, varieties. They, um, they're really good for the soil. So there are some plants that take a lot from the soil, and beans are really good at giving back. There, it's called a nitrogen fixer. So uh, every plant needs NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, um, but they can't get it from the air. So beans take it from the air, put it in the soil. So it's uh, it's, it's great for your garden. Big reason that uh, that beans are such an exciting choice this year is they're very easy to save the seeds. So um, there's some plants if you save the seeds. It won't necessarily grow true, but beans will, as long as you get a variety that's an heirloom variety that's been passed on. Some of them are known to be hundreds or thousands of years old passed on. So we pick them for, for the ability to save because um, there's a, a really cool thing happening at the Duluth Public Library, which is a seed lending library. And the way it works is you go in, you check out some seeds, you bring them home, you plant them in your garden, and then uh, at the end of the season, you let the bean pods stay on the plant, they dry up, and when they get rattly, you can pull them off and out come these beautiful dried hard beans. And if you keep them in a dry spot, you can plant them the next year. And the library then will check out those seeds and you can bring back seeds in the fall. And 
uh, six seeds could be 600 beans. It's important to, to plant beans in warm soil. But if it's too wet, then um, the beans will rot. These are about 10 days old. This is about how big your bean would get if you stuck it in the ground and let it grow. You can see here, I started them in a plastic baggie. Some of them actually started to rot. And this is what happens if you put your beans out when it's not warm enough and, um, and if they get too moist. These are some plants that my students have grown. And this is what they would look like in your garden at about 35 days. So they grow really pretty rapidly. Uh, some of the varieties you can start eating beans in two months. Most people don't start beans inside and transplant them. They, they don't transplant very well. But uh, these students are going to give it a try and see how they work. A nice thing about beans too is that they're really pretty hardy. Once they get established and they start growing, um, they can make it through some pretty long dry spells too and still be pretty productive. The beauty of beans too is that it's got this long season of being able to eat it. You know, we can eat the green ones all summer. And then if you save your dried beans, you can cook them up like any pinto bean you'd get at the store or any, uh, any soup bean you get. Through the One Vegetable, One Community, we do a, um, quite a lot of um, cooking demonstrations throughout the summer. So we go around the city and we will cook up whatever the vegetable of the year is. Last year we did a lot of uh, grilled zucchini. And this year we're going to grill uh, green beans. When food is fresh, it doesn't take a lot of, uh, a lot of flavorings to make it delicious. All right, very interesting and nice uh, exciting project. A little bit of a clarification about the, the nitrogen in the beans. Yeah, they're all legumes and mm -hmm. they fix nitrogen, which is unique. Um, but you still need a good fertile soil because a lot okay. of that nitrogen gets picked up and incorporated in the bean, and that's where the protein comes from. Mm. So you have a lot of net nitrogen addition if you're actually cultivating in the, the, the bean in the bean seed itself. So make sure you've got good uh, fertile soil, and I think also the tip, uh, you might want to delay planting just a little bit, particularly mm -hmm. untreated seed. Uh, you really want that uh, soil to warm up. Right. And most snap beans are going to be 55 days, so you've got all kinds of season ahead of you. So uh, don't be concerned about uh, not having enough season. Be more concerned about cool, wet soils, which can, uh, can rot the seed. Mm -hmm. As he mentioned, great, great information. And to learn more about the planting, care, and harvesting of beans, go to DuluthCommunityGarden.org. You can also find out more about One Vegetable, One Community. And we also want to tell you about uh, what they're calling Sunday work days at the Hillside public orchard and that orchard again is at as soon as i find my address here sixth avenue east and 10th street yep. it's right right by udac in duluth and it's a place where people are gathering to plant and they also can come in to harvest but sunday june 1st they're going to be planting beans and providing bean seeds so that would be a good time to go there and, uh, and uh, the hillside orchard is such a great idea yes. Um, and the folks there that started that a few years ago and, and having those fruit trees and really available for the community to come and harvest from and, and to share in that experience. So. We're going to take a tour there in two weeks on Great Gardening. We were there last summer and so we have a great tour Very to, cool. uh, to Very show. Cool. So that'll be a lot of fun. Let's get to more questions that are coming in tonight. Stephanie from Duluth has two lilacs that are very old. The deer have stripped the bark off them from the ground up. What can she do? Uh, more than likely it wasn't deer. I'm guessing it was more than likely rabbits. Um, <clears throat> she can cut down below where they've stripped and they are gonna re-sprout for her. Lilacs are tough, tough plants, but she'll wanna go in and cut all that off and let them sprout again and the plants are gonna be fine. Probably not gonna bloom for her this year, but in uh, future years should be just outstanding. So. Okay, great. Uh, Annie from West Duluth has tomato plants in a container and is wondering how deep should the container be for the plant's roots? Okay, tomato is a rather unique plant, one of few actually, where you can actually sprout roots along the main stem. So she can really take those stems, particularly if they're a little elongated, and actually uh, drop it down into the soil. Uh, I wouldn't suggest more than about six inches at a maximum. If she has longer stems, then you can t make kind of a a hook there and actually get that stem uh, laid kind of parallel down the soil and under the soil and try to do it th that way. But yes, the long leggy plants, you want to get them in the soil uh, relatively deep. And they will sprout rather than rot. They'll sprout roots. Rather unique to the now, plant. Now you're saying in the garden from the container, but what if we keep them in the container? Or were you referencing that as well? 
Well, she won't want to keep them in the container okay. because they, they have very aggressive root system. If you have a, a tomato that has a, a three foot, four foot top stock, it probably has two and a half, three feet of roots. So consequently, it's not going to be happy in the container. It'll be too root bound. So they will come out of the container and then uh, she can set it in a little bit deep uh, up that stem. Make sure you protect the stem from a uh, cutworm with some kind of a wrap because oh, that's sure. uh, those stems are very vulnerable, uh, particularly early in the season. Okay. Mark from Duluth wants to know what's the best way to overwinter hosta in a container? <laughs> um, I'm laughing because I, lots of folks are, are doing containers okay. with perennials, whether it's the hookara that we showed or, or other perennials like hostas. The best thing he should, uh, the thing he should do is really to sink that container in the soil, ground level. So if he's got a pot of, uh, of hostas next fall after he's grown them in the container, take the container, put it at ground level. Uh, the plant will be just fine. You need the, to get that insulation from the soil around it, and the plant will do just fine for them, and especially hostas will, will be fine. So. Okay, great. All right, well, on to our tour now. Up on the hill in the biggest city on the Iron Range, it can be challenging to grow a lush garden, but you'd never know it looking at this landscape. I'm Donna Stuntebeck, and you're in my backyard in Hibbing, Minnesota. I started digging underneath my pine tree, and the story goes on from there. Well, it is all perennials. And the globe thistle, a lot of people don't like it. I love it. It's a beautiful, beautiful purple flower, and it grows wild. This is all a shade garden, a stilby, hostas, um, lots of different varieties of hostas. Most of them given to me as little itty bitty things and they're just growing wild. Uh, a lot of uh, ground cover. I like sedum, I like ground cover, so I have a lot of it everywhere. Pam, my garden here is uh, all for foliage. There's almost no flowering of anything in here. This is my pergola, which I've got uh, this is a variation of a clematis. It's a real old fashioned clematis. Again, I got it as a starter from someone. And I put some annuals in here. Just a good sitting spot. I love to come out here and just sit and enjoy. And when I have company, we come out here. And a couple of years ago, I had electricity put in it so we can use it more at night. And that's been kind of fun. And what I'm trying to do here is to put a woodland garden. Gardening up on the hill here is not easy. It's a taconite situation. So it's basically rock. There's almost no topsoil. And also I keep almost all of my antique gardening, farming things that I pick up in here. So I've got uh, various utensils used on farms. I've got ferns growing in here also. One of my favorite plants is a Virginia, which is all through my garden, but it's the first thing you'll see in my garden in the spring. So it heralds spring. Kind of a nice plant. Underused in Minnesota gardens. I don't know why, it's beautiful. In the center, again, I've got my border going here. And uh, a funny thing that I could tell you about the border is that this whole thing was started with two plants. We have liatris, we have um, some spirea, I've got uh, melva coming up here. Again, I've been experimenting with succulents, and so I've turned my bird bath into a succulent uh, flower pot. We have a mountain ash in here. And it's a real old one, and it's slowly losing its leaves, but I love it because it lends a kind of an eerie touch to my garden. Uh, if you want to just kind of take a peek in here and see all my angels asleep, that's kind of fun to see. My grandchildren love them. They love to be in the garden. Half shade, half sun. Uh, you can see where the monarda has taken over, but we have Shasta daisies in here. This is, in a couple of days, going to be a globe flower. Um, this is going to be a beautiful, beautiful yellow, fluffy flower, like a mop head. 
And then when they're all done, the birds will come and eat. I do fertilize. And um, up until the end of July, I fertilize most things about once a week. I find that you have to. There's no way that you're going to really garden up here unless you give it some help. So everybody loves my birch tree because it gives such shade here. It's a river birch. But what inspires me really is to see other gardens, see how things go, and just come out here and see something that's really pretty and peaceful. I just love it. Thanks to Donna. Wow. Donna's yeah, quite the gardener, isn't yeah, she? she is. Look she at is. the plants, and, and we're right on the cusp of seeing all those kinds of things. So it's an exciting right. time in the garden. And One thing she have... mentioned was uh, the, the tough conditions of the soil up there, so really amending is a good idea. Shows you what you can do, and for those in the intro, the largest city on the range, that must be Hibbing, is it? It is Hibbing, yes. <laughs> yes, she said she was in Hibbing, yes. Okay. <laughs> That's it, okay. Well, we have uh, more questions coming in. We'll get to those. Uh, some questions about raspberries here. Uh, Brian and Culver says, wild raspberries, if cross-pollinated with tame ones, do they become smaller or weaker? Or fall? And, and he said they fall apart, and I don't know if he's asking if they fall apart. The, the size of the berry is actually going to be determined by the genetics of the actual cane, the plant itself, so pollination won't make a difference in the berry size. The problem we have with wild berries planted with cultivated berries is the wild are a source for virus. They're just a huge reservoir. So we always recommend that you eliminate all of the uh, wild berries before you establish a cultivated berry patch. And our other uh, berry question from Clyde, who ordered raspberries, wants to know what he needs to do to the soil, in parentheses, sandy loam, and how to get them in the ground. Okay, uh, sandy loam, that's good, very good. Even okay. though uh, raspberries will tolerate uh, heavy soils as well, clays and so forth, but sandy loam is just about perfect. Um, you want to make sure all perennial weeds are out. That's all the quack grass, tansy, and those types of things, number one. And then when he takes the canes and moves them in, you'll get them established, and you cut that initial cane back. And this is going to be the live cane. This is what we call the first year of flora cane, prima cane. Uh, he's going to cut it back to about eight inches and then just let it re-sprout. Okay, and one more quick one on raspberries. Dick wants to know, can I grow Ann, golden raspberries, and Duluth Heights have a large patch of red raspberries, and uh, can I plant them with the golden? And are they available locally? Mm, you can. Well, maybe that's not quick, but <laughs> let's <laughs> yeah. try. It. Uh, Ann is a variety. It will, will grow in this area. Uh, fall bearer. Uh, it should do okay in the heights. They don't have the vigor, and we tend to lose them over time. Uh, they won't cross, so mm -hmm. you, you will still have golden on the golden plants and reds on the reds, okay. but they intertwine so that it gets a little confusing sometimes. Okay, well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> Confusion Ruth, in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth from Virginia wants to know, when she cleans up the needles under her cedar trees, what can she do with them? Can they go in the compost? Sure. They're just going to take okay. a little longer to compost. Mm -hmm. um, but she can certainly add it to it or, or uh, use it as a mulch um, in the garden if she wants or in areas or along pathways, okay. things like that. They work good for so. Good points, they don't break down, so they're slow to break down in the compost pile, but they do not acidify the soil. So we've got other agents that do acidify the soil, but uh, pine needles uh, from any of the evergreens uh, don't really cause any soil acidity. All right, Jerry from Duluth, uh, how will a wall of water work for newly planted tomato plants? Okay, wall of water is, is really a device that has columns of water and as, temperatures drop and we approach freezing, uh, if we get to this, the state change, we're actually liberating heat around the plant. So yes, they can provide some frost protection, but uh, down maybe uh, a couple of degrees and uh, they can be helpful. Okay. Um, Evelyn from Grand Marais wants, oh, information about the Seed Lending Library. It's in Duluth and it's on their website and you can link it from our website. And so the Community Gardening website And as well. the Community Gardening website. So take a look there. Uh, we also have a question about publications of home remedies for general planting. I don't know if... We have to look at it. There are, there are a number out there. There's uh, some, the, the viability or the reliability of some of this, I'm not really certain of, though. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've got a question. All right. Um, deer, do deer eat grapevines? And that's coming from PJ in Hibbing. The answer is yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs>
and took grapes care of that probably one. too, right? <laughs> and the grapes. <laughs> all right. Yeah, they don't wait for the grapes, do that's, they? <laughs> that's all the time we have for questions right now. But some upcoming garden events that you might want to check out include the Altrusa Garden Affair that comes up on May 31st. It's at 52nd Avenue East and Superior Street. They have plants for sale. And Tom, I know uh, you want to talk about the uh, annual plant sale at the Rose Garden as right. well. Yep, uh, the 19th annual plant sale is coming up. We did move it. It's been generally on Memorial Day weekend, but we moved it to a week later. So it's a week from this coming Saturday, the 31st of May, uh, in the Rose Garden parking lot, 8 a.m. Big sale, lots right. of plants grown by lots of local gardeners. And then if I might say, because you always sell out, there will be one more opportunity. The St. Louis <laughs> County Master Gardeners the following weekend are going to have a plant sale right. at St. Lawrence Church the following Saturday. So at there St. are Lawrence. going to be opportunities. Okay, and that's Lawrence in, uh, in Piedmont. Piedmont. Yes. All right. Okay, well, we also want to tell you to uh, check out our webpage for more on our calendar information from our shows. And you can also look at full past episodes of Great Gardening. That's all the time we have for now for this edition, and we want to... Give our hearty thanks to Bob Olin and Tom Casper for all your expert advice once again. Also to our phone volunteers from the Duluth Garden Flower Society. And also we want to tell you to be sure and get out there and support your local garden centers and greenhouses. And from all of us here at Great Gardening, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.